Welcome to the Judgment Call Podcast, a podcast where I bring together some of the most curious minds on the planet. Risk takers, adventurers, travelers, investors, entrepreneurs, and simply mind bogglers. To find all episodes of this show, simply go to Spotify, iTunes, or YouTube, or go to our website, judgmentcallpodcast.com. If you like this show, please consider leaving a review on iTunes or subscribe to us on YouTube. This episode of the Judgment Call Podcast is sponsored by Mighty Travels Premium. Full disclosure, this is my business. What we do at Mighty Travels Premium is to find the airfare deals that you really want. Thousands of subscribers have saved up to 95% in the airfare. Those include $150 round-trip tickets to Hawaii for many cities in the US, or $600 life led tickets in business class from the US to Asia, or $100 business class life led tickets from Africa round trip all the way to Asia. In case you didn't know, about half the world is open for business again and accepts travelers. Most of those countries are in South America, Africa and Eastern Europe. To try out Mighty Travels Premium, go to mightytravels.com slash MTP or if that's too many letters for you, simply go to MTP, the number four, and the letter u.com to sign up for your 30 day free trial. I find this fascinating. And I, I think you are part of a very short list of people that went to all the 193 different countries. And I know it's, it's, it's quite a dispute out there. Who's the most traveled person <laughs> in the world and who does it the best way and who, 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 who does the most sophisticated way and who has the most impact. So I, I am not a fan of any of those uh, debates because I feel like we all should do the best we can. And this is a thing that's maybe, it is hard to measure because there's so many different ways to travel. But yeah. how did that start? How did you, when did you formulate that goal? I think for a lot of us, uh, we, we are eight years old and we say we want to go to all of these countries. <laughs> well, when did it become more specific for you? Uh, and uh, how did you plan to get there? Well, well, I, I first want to address your 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 first uh, observation because I I I believe I strongly believe that um, uh, travel is not uh, it's not a sport. So there's for me there's no best traveler or there's no most traveled person or there is no uh, none of those things. And and um, I look a little bit like surprise when 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 people try to be the fastest uh, who 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 takes off 193 countries and then you find out you find out they do it in, uh, in in a year and a half or something and 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 if well do your math and it means that you spend like a day in each country and then obviously you can you can you can discuss whether that makes any sense at all or is, if that's really <laughs> a new olympic sport <laughs> Um, yeah, I saw so, someone so, so, in his twenties, early twenties, who yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, there's many. I think that's there's, how you decide. There's many. Yeah, there's many now, and um, and I just saw a new guy who um, uh, apparently was unfortunate enough to to try to do it in in the pandemic, which obviously he didn't know beforehand. But uh, and and he, I think he just went to Libya. But um, but anyway, I, I'm 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 totally not into that. I, I don't. I honestly cannot think that anyone can claim to be the best travel uh, person because because you know I, I know people who went to the same country for 30 years and they know the country inside out they know they speak the language they 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 they, they they're almost a local um they did not take off 100, 193 countries but they saw so much of just one country that in a way they're also very traveled but just focused on one place or maybe a couple, but so anyway, um, your real question was, <laughs> how did it start? Um, my, um, um, when I was five months old, my parents took me on a, uh, a train trip through Europe to Greece. So that's uh, like two and a half days by train. And um, I still believe that, that 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 kind of started me being a traveler. Um, they, they were avid travelers themselves, and we we uh, traveled every year. Um, and I still have uh, some some di diaries I uh, I wrote when I was um, uh, in in uh, <coughs> sorry in uh, in high school or in in first grade school. So 
Um, and I can see when I was nine years old, I was already counting countries. I was already writing down, this is my 21st country, <laughs> which okay. actually happened, which actually happened to be Syria for, for some reason. And um, so, but no, but no I, I was not at all considering um, visiting all countries back then, but I was just counting like how many countries did I visit because I wanted, I always had this urge to see uh, new places. And then, um, uh, which I just continued doing when I, was, when I was an adult. I always, when I traveled, I always went to places I hadn't been before, uh, which is, I think, a very healthy um, uh, curiosity to uh, that, that pretty much drove me to travel. And then the deciding point was in uh, 2008 when I had a very, uh, very ugly breakup with my um, then girlfriend. And uh, um, basically... I was in uh, in deep shit, so to say. So I, I I I realized I needed something positive to get out of there, and 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 that's when I decided, you know what, I'm going to visit all countries in the world. And I, back then I had like 72 left, I think. Um, and I set myself, I gave myself 10 years to 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 visit the remaining uh, 72 countries. Yeah, so, it seems like the the that travel, and I think this is a a rarely talked about um, aspect is a bit like they say, you know, buying a motorcycle, riding a motorcycle, is just like taking antidepressants. And I think <laughs> travel, at least for men, typically that's sad. Um, for, for women, it might be slightly different. But there is this, this, this aspect of travel that it gives you a new horizon, right? It gives you uh, not just the, the positivism of other people, if you can find it, that's sometimes harder than, than it looks. Um, um, we're going to get into this and how you how you have on your website, you have profiles um, of how you interacted with people um, in a specific country. And I think this is really interesting. This is, this is something that most people don't really pay enough attention to. But I think there is this, this wonderful aspect of, of travel as a way of not just, not just seeing the world in a better way, view which we've talked about on the podcast with other guests here before because i always say you know you, you don't go to a country and then you come back and you decide to nuke that country like it's never that's never going to happen right so you will at least have a, an impression of that country and there will be some positive moments even if it was a terrible trip and everything fell apart but it's also something that makes us much much more positive i think to to look towards the world and to look towards other countries and we had simon and halt here who um, uh, runs the Good Country Index, and a surprising finding he he sees in the data is especially when things get, or maybe that's the result of going to different countries, but he sees there's a long-term trend that people have a more positive outlook towards other places, towards other countries as life goes on. So every decade this goes up and you need to like put the average uh, further further down so you, you you have this you normalize the data kind of like the iq works right so people get smarter over time even though it, it doesn't happen um for for everyone individually um did it work for you would be my question uh, absolutely oh absolutely absolutely um actually you, you you i think you you meant to say that uh, the, 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 the Harley Davidsons or whatever motorcycles work only for men, but I think traveling also works for women because I actually know women who um, who also were in, the, in, the, in the, like in a depression or something, and they started traveling to uh, as as kind of a therapy, and and also for them it, it really worked. But but yeah, for me, um, it was um, it was very hard in the beginning because because I used to travel with my um, with my ex-partner and um, obviously I was traveling by myself, so I missed her, but then uh, pretty soon I started meeting new people, seeing new places, um, getting um, uh, carried away by, the, by all the excitement that travel brings. And then, um, uh, and, and I even believe I can say that I, I became a better person of it because, uh, because I met so much uh, kindness and, um, uh, especially in places where where I didn't really expect it beforehand, because you know they're supposedly dangerous places with people who are trying to kill you, or at least so they say. <laughs> and then you yeah, and then you actually uh, uh, you travel around that 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 country and you find out you know what these people are just great. I mean, obviously every country have have their share of um, 
uh, of bad guys. Um, but that's that's just that's that's minimal. I mean, but by far most people um, uh, want well, and, and especially when when they see a foreigner, they uh, I think the natural uh, reaction is to to help out, to protect, to to uh, provide whatever lodging, accommodation, food, uh, drinks. Um, th this is what I found uh, almost everywhere. Yeah, I yeah, was, the, the, um, the, go ahead. Sorry. Well, the only, the only, the only thing, um, uh, but we, we might uh, touch on that later on, but the only thing uh, I also found that like the downside of travel in some countries can be um, authorities, um, red tape, bureaucracy, um, you know, policemen who are out there trying to get something from you so 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 but that's that's like <laughs> um part, part of the story of travel of course but but mostly i mean obviously mostly you're dealing with um ordinary people who are who you meet on the bus or a train or on the street or in a restaurant or anywhere else and 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 by far most of them are are, are just they're curious i mean they, they especially in, in in, in more isolated remote places or more so to say dangerous places they they don't see many foreigners so so very often they're super happy and super curious to to hear about uh, a part of the world that they just really don't know I mean they, they know the name sometimes they don't know the name sometimes they do but they, they obviously they, they often have they have very little clue of what our lives look like so, yeah I think it's uh, I absolutely share the sentiment in general. I think you're absolutely right. There is um, a natural curiosity that is something really positive and that 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 is a social value that kind of is a social glue um, that that is out there and makes people talk to each other. I think this is this is extremely um, positive and you find it in many, many places. What I found and this maybe leads us to the way you you how you actually travel and how you come up with the specific trips when you go to a new country or when you go to a country you've already been to. What I find relatively hard, given my schedule, I typically do trips, and I think I'm not alone with this. A lot of people have that problem. I can organize my own trips, which is great, but I only have a limited time span. Say it's 10 days, it's 14 days, and I got to be back within these time frames. But I can do a couple of those across the year, and I think this is true for many people, right? So there is things you need to take care of at home that they just can't wait forever. The problem seems to be, at least for me, um, the way I, I I I set up these 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 trips, I can only get away so far from the typical tourist infrastructure, where I typically don't see a lot of curiosity. What I see are grumpy immigration agents, are people that want to take advantage of you, the taxi drivers, right? In every country, um, there is always someone who is either too. A little bit too nice, you know. Those are the con men um, that you that are not everywhere, but they, they are definitely in certain places. You you get to the place where you can recognize them, but there is a certain set of of and there's always jet lag and there's things where you you just can't appreciate it because you're just you're not ready, right? You didn't have coffee, you didn't sleep in three or four days. So there is a couple of things within a 10 day trip that just makes it so hard for me to get outside of this tourist infrastructure. So until I get to a place that's remote enough, that's interesting enough where I don't, I'm not in the middle of a big bus maelstrom or another transport thing, it's four, four or five days. And by that time I always have to turn around. So for me, I find that really difficult. And I think this is why we see these, these maelstroms pre COVID of, I call it the dark side of tourism, where people are in this, you know, they're, they're not really aware, they don't want to really be aware. I mean, I go on my own, but a lot of people obviously go with groups or they go with lots lots of big, big groups of friends. And what happens is you kind of travel loses this opportunity to, to experience not just curiosity, but experience places that are relatively well, they don't have crowds of people. They're, they're, they're relatively unspoiled. That's what I wanted to say. And I'm like kind of like you before you were going fully full on the list. I'm at um, I've seen many, many places and regions. I've been to many places several times, um, but I kind of find myself going down the same avenues. So the last seventy countries they're hard for me because I can't do them in a ten day trip from what I know, or I don't have the risk 
profile for it. Maybe you can convince me differently. But I think that's a problem <laughs> for a lot of people. In the time that we have, it's difficult to really appreciate travel. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I see what you mean. And um, I, I believe that um, maybe there's a law that um, a travel law, I'm just, I'm just improvising now, but um, it might be true that um, the less time it takes to get to a place, the, the longer time you would need to, to delve into the unexplored part of that country. If you see what I mean, so so what you're saying is 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 I recognize that, and actually, uh, in this after I so I I finished my um, or I visited my last country uh, almost four years ago, and um, obviously I I continue traveling, um, and I realized that I really do not like to travel to um, to touristy places. Like I was in Sri Lanka a few a few years ago, and uh, I had been there before, of course, but uh, I noticed that in many places, like I had to queue to buy a ticket to get into a archaeological park or whatever. And then I had to queue to walk upstairs. I had to queue to see a painting. I had to queue. And I was like, I, I don't want this. So, so yeah, sure. You need, you need more time to get off that um, beaten path. Um, that said, there's, there's still a pretty long list of countries where there is no beaten path. Believe it or not, I, 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 when I when I um, when I decided to visit to go for 193 in 2008, uh, I uh, I um, uh, I made a list of all the countries that were missing on my um, well on my <laughs> on my list. So um, and there were some of those I I didn't even know where they were on the map. So I I really had to. <laughs> this sounds really weird, but I really had to look them up like. Nauru, what the hell is Nauru, and um, uh, and a few other smaller smaller countries or unknown countries. Um, and the list and keeps of, changing, right? So there's new countries that come along, and uh, well, so there's, there's but, about but, yeah, five or but, ten but, that keep seem to be in limbo. But 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 not really, because the the last, at least if you stick to the UN list, the last country to um, to be added was South Sudan, uh, which is in 2011. So that's 10 years ago. And the one before was East Timor, which is in 2002, I think, uh, which again okay. is 20 years. So in the last 20 years, only two countries were added. So that that's not, I mean, this happened in the 90s when, when the Soviet Union fell apart, when Yugoslavia fell apart, um, and a few other countries were, 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 um, uh, were born, but, um, uh, I, I do. I don't. I do not even see uh, any new country being born anytime soon because it, because then it needs to be recognized, right, by by um, by other member states. So but I wouldn't how even. How easy would have been in the eighties because the whole Soviet Union would be one passport stamp, and now it's about twenty countries. So um, I um, lost um, out on that easy opportunity. We'll I, I, uh, well, yeah. Oh, I, I, I just, uh, as I, I think I told you, I just finished writing a book about my travels and, um, or actually about the risk of traveling. And uh, I calculated how much, how many countries there were in the year I was born, and there were only 124. So yeah. in, in, my in my lifetime, we went from 124 to 193. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah. There's also but, but, way more yeah. people, I guess. Um, I guess what, probably again. it was three, four billion. Um, I, I don't know when you were born, uh, but the number was shockingly low. That's, that's an interesting. Yeah, I, I, sh I should, I should look into that as well. But, um, but yeah. So, so, but yet, yeah, so to answer your question, I, 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 I'm convinced there's still a lot of places where, where, uh, where you do not have to travel ten days to find uh, a real. Um, let's say authentic experience, and where you are not harassed by um, guys selling tours or guys selling their souvenirs or guys selling whatever, um, which is what what um, yeah, I, I, which is what I try to avoid. Yeah, absolutely. That 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 said, ten day ten days is is short. I mean, it, it, most of my travels were were definitely more than that. 
But, well, give um, us an idea. Maybe as a preview, we're going to dive into more of these countries in, in just a little bit. I really like your website, by the way, um, traveladventures.org. Um, I've never seen it before. I've never came across it. Um, but it has really good um, previews on each specific country. And then it goes into trip reports, specific things you did within a certain country. That could be the places within a city or it could be a specific excursion that you did. And I think for most of these countries, and I consider myself very knowledgeable, I've never heard of any of these trips. So I think it's awesome. Right. Um, so, so that's amazing knowledge that you have there that I just wasn't aware of. I mean, you can find these things. The trouble is always, how do you how do you condense it into an easy form? And I think you've done a wonderful job there. I, I always think there is this holy matrix of travel destinations that a lot of people follow. And one is... And maybe you can help us find surprising destinations that people wouldn't have on their list already. So I think one parameter that a lot of people look for is obviously friendly locals, people that don't harass you. I always think Morocco and Egypt, those, you only meet people who want to harass you. There's tons of friendly people there, but you never get to see them unless you speak Arabic and you have tons of friends there. And then we always want great value, right? We want um, places that either just came out of a crisis or for whatever reason are very affordable compared to European or American standards. And uh, warm weather is usually good for most people. I, could, I, I, I count myself I, I, as part of that. I grew up in Germany and uh, I, I can't stand the cold weather um, anymore. And then there's always the question about food for me, that's particularly tricky in some places in Africa where it just I can't agree with the food. I, I just, I, I don't know. I mean, I can go back to the basics and eat some veggies, but whatever food and dishes are being, being cooked and presented to me, I just, I can't deal with it. I can't negotiate it. Um, so maybe you can help us find, using this matrix, and maybe there's more, maybe you know, you probably have way more parameters than this um, that are relatively easily accessible. That's maybe one, one more of those parameters. Uh, where would you feel like this is really... A surprising destination that people don't have on their lists and assuming COVID will go away not completely but it will accept travelers and vaccinations let, very soon again yeah and uh, exactly and let's 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 yeah let's pretend um we're talking uh we disregard disregard the the pandemic <laughs> yes well, I, I, no, I'm, I'm very... want to disregard it but it seems to be that once the vaccinations are through everyone will open up to vaccinated travelers that seems yeah, to be yeah, the trend I'm... right now hopefully it's sure true. sure 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 but I, but I'm what I'm trying to say is uh, let, let's just talk as if we can just travel because because yeah. I'm, I'm convinced one day this will happen again I mean we will not be stuck forever yeah and 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 as as human beings we are just uh, we are curious so we will travel Um any question is when but so yeah um okay good <laughs> that's um an well, easy I question know. right well yeah <laughs> so um uh, as for food this is obviously a very personal thing and i i totally understand what you're saying um some countries are i just have a better cuisine than others and um uh, i suffered in a few uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, there it's just a matter of taste, and it's also a matter of being flexible and and to 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 just forget, um, you know, better food. I I remember if 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 I'm allowed to say to 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 like sidestep to a different story. I I was traveling with an Italian guy in uh, Tajikistan and um, in Central Asia, and and we were uh, like for more than a week, and. Like every dish has, um, uh, how do you call it, coriander. Uh, I think it's a different name, but you know this this herb um, which they use to spice up their food. And he just I think cilantro not... is the other word for it. Cila that's, that, the that's it. Word, that, but it's coriander, that, I think, in Middle East and um, that's, that's yeah, that's the word I was looking for, cilantro. So so he just couldn't stand it, and he was every day he was dreaming about having Italian food, and oh, I could, if only I could have a. Uh, this nice pasta with this and this sauce or you know this proper uh, so we were having this this fun discussion because i i was like teasing him i was like well you just torture yourself because you're not going to find that here so <laughs> why don't you just let go of your italian food and just uh you know eat whatever is available because there's 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 no choice i mean this is what it is that you yeah. that's it so <laughs> so um 
so countries which are um, easily accessible and which are surprising and which people might not know about. The first thing, first country coming to mind would be uh, Sao Tome Principe, which is in, um, uh, let's say, south of uh, Cameroon um, and west of probably Gabon. Uh, anyway, it's in, in, in that little corner in, Afri in, in south of West Africa, uh, which is, um, uh, it's, it, they're just, they're two islands. Sao Tome is one island and Principe is the next one. And they, they were uh, a Portuguese colony. Um, so what I really liked, so that, that, that would be one of the countries I, I had not heard of before. Uh, I started going for 193 and it was one of the countries where I really was, was thinking, why is there no tourism here? Because this is like, um, especially from, for Europe, it's the same time zone. It's, it's not too far. Uh, it has beautiful nature with a lot of variations. There's like beaches, there's mountains with very peculiar shapes. Uh, it's tropical. Uh, the climate is nice. You get tropical food. Uh, fruits and the food is fantastic. I mean, you, you really get fresh fish every day. You, you get really good food. There is history. Um, it, it was a um, uh, cacao uh, growing uh, island, especially um, Sao Tome. Uh, so you have all these old colonial, <clears throat> sorry, colonial uh, Portuguese buildings, uh, even with trade tracks where they used to grow. Um, uh, cocoa and and um, uh, transported to Europe, <clears throat> so you you can visit those uh, plantations, um, and um, people are nice. It's it's small. You can you can see it in a couple of days. It, you don't need like well for, for you it would be perfect. Like ten days, you, you could see much. You could see most of it. You can do diving. You can you can you can do a beach day. You can well pretty much whatever you want. So, I remember so, um, Lufthansa has a direct service from Frankfurt, and I couldn't believe it. Oh, they do? So, really? Ah. Yeah, and I, I think it had a huge oil boom um, during the last three, four years, uh, pre-COVID, that is. And uh, I don't know what the connection to Germany is, but they don't run a lot of direct flights to Africa, Lufthansa, but they always have one. I think their capital is Malabo, is that correct? No, 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 that's uh, Equatorial Guinea. Oh, okay. Well, maybe yeah. it's, uh, maybe it's, it's continuous it's, it's from pretty, there. It's pretty close, mm -hmm. but yeah. Yeah. Now, as far as I know, as far as I know, um, uh, tap tap serves it uh, several times a week. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. And um, because I'm I'm not even sure they have oil. I know Equatorial Guinea obviously has a lot of oil, but um, okay, maybe I'm mistaken. Maybe I'm mistaken. Well, I don't know, but actually, that, do some that's research. That, uh, Equatorial Guinea actually was probably my worst experience ever. So that I would definitely not advise that as a tourist destination. <laughs> <laughs> What's the problem? But I heard good things about Equatorial Guinea, the, well, relatively good things. The problem is that they, um, it, for, first of all, it's super, super hard to get a visa. I'm, I'm talking, uh, I visited in 2013, uh, as far as I remember. And, and back then, I'm not sure about the current situation. Back then, a visa was almost impossible to get uh, first. And then secondly, um, uh, I managed I managed to get one for like a crazy, crazy amount of uh, money in uh, Gabon. Uh, and then I had a lot of trouble getting into the country, even though I had a valid visa, they, they made a lot of mess. It was really, it was a nightmare. They always almost put me in jail. Um, and then uh, you need a, a, a photo permit. You cannot go anywhere because they, um, <clears throat> so as a foreigner, they, they probably do not want to uh, to have people traveling around by themselves, and um, the the government, well, the, the 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 dictator ruling the country because it's 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 a very rich country. I think per capita, uh, potentially they're richer than any of the Gulf states in uh, the Persian Gulf. Um, yeah. But all the money goes to that one family, and the rest of the people are just suffering like crazy. So, um, yeah. so it's also most, socially. Most of the times. In, in Africa, what I found <clears throat> that might not be true for Equatorial Guinea is that there's kind of an informal visa system. So typically when you need a visa before you go to a country, right, and then the airline will check it before you board because they are afraid of um, the fines that they would have to pay or they would have to 
bring you back and then do you take up a seat, right? So they check that in, in particular. But in most places in Africa, there seems to be either no fines or there seems to be no enforcement of this. And I noticed from Ethiopian Airlines, I think most countries I went to in, in Africa, I'd say 50, 60% of the time, the visa was never checked at time of boarding. What that means is you can just fly there, literally you stand in immigration, you can present your case. Um, and I, I, there was a case in Sudan where I was last year. Um, I was basically just, I was there for a transfer, but this, and you typically have to pre-arrange a visa, you have to go through an embassy and uh, you can't just walk in. Um, but this is exactly what I did. And I said, well, you know, I'm here, so why don't you let me in? And, he's, and he said, no, 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 you can't, you know, it's not possible. So I had to wait 15 minutes and he came again and said, well, did you bring some cash? And I'm like, yes. <laughs> he said, yeah, well, you, you're good to go. Um, tell me how long you want to stay. And that, that seems to be true in big parts of Africa, maybe not in Equatorial Guinea, where I wouldn't say it's necessarily corruption, but there is a process in place. It's extremely difficult for pretty much anyone to visit. And it's, it seems to be huge trouble to get the visa. But if you try without it, 50% of the time, you're good to go. I, I even know a story for Equatorial Guinea where people had a visa, uh, they got it in Germany and they flew down to Malabo and they arrived at the airport with their valid visa and the uh, the officer goes like, yeah, we decided we will not let anyone in today. So he invalidated their visa and they were sent back on the same flight. So, <laughs> okay, well that's a bad uh, example I, then. I, I know. Like yeah, I know another uh, a few months before I crossed, because I crossed over land from Gabon and a few months before uh, a German guy had done the same crossing and uh, I had read his story before I went there and he, he, so he, he was unlucky, unfortunate to cross the border on the 1st of January. Uh, so he had a lot of trouble getting into the country, like, just like I did. And then he, um, he rechecked his passport when he, finally got through he checked his passport when he was in his hotel and then he saw that they the date stamp was not adjusted so the year was still the previous year so yeah. he went back the next day to to ask them you need to correct the stamp and then they they um these were the same persons because the, he was talking to the guy who put the stamp and instead of admitting his error he was thrown out as a criminal because they they claimed that he overstayed his visa for a year which was yeah. obviously Shocker. ridiculous because Shocker. yeah Who because have seen that coming <laughs> but so yeah so um anyway but um yeah. i i back, went to back, gabon back. and i don't know if this makes makes is any comparison but i went to gabon i found this relatively pleasant um uh, people were very very worried about talking to anyone it seemed to be a bit of a police state um and it seemed to be pleasant in the sense of because it was easy to get around, good roads and everything. But it was extremely boring. Um, that's how I remember my trip. Maybe it doesn't apply to the nature because I didn't do any nature trips. Um, I'm kind of lazy. Um, but maybe that also applies to Equatorial Guinea. Maybe it's totally different. Um, well, it's, it's, it's comparable. I, I think it's much more of a police state. So, so people are um, they were not really shy. Um, uh, I speak Spanish because it's it's the only Spanish-speaking country in in Africa, and um, uh, people are actually um, very much willing to talk to me, and 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 some of them even uh, begged me to to please write up a story about our country because it's uh, no one knows about us, and and we are suffering, and uh, uh, so so um, so for some reason they were not even afraid to. Um, uh, to talk to me. This is outside of the big cities. This is like in small villages, and uh, and they were telling me stories like, yeah, it, it 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 made me super sad to hear what they had to live through because so that that was basically a consolation for myself because I was like, okay, I'm I'm out of here next week, but they have to live here like every day, so they didn't even yeah. have a choice. They they are they're stuck. Um, but. Yeah, Gabon has, actually Gabon has a few nice places, but you need to get out of um, uh, yeah, you need to get out of Libreville and, and and really go somewhere. It's a pretty big country. But yeah, yeah. let's go back they, to this to the to the list of the surprising yeah, destinations. Yeah, 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 Sao Tome sure. and Prince of Bay I would have never called. So I mean, I I think you mentioned it on your website. That's why I would have known maybe. But besides this, I would have never known about it. Maybe you have another one for us. Um, so we're still looking for uh, unknown or surprising countries, right? 
Yeah, um, you're like very undervalued countries. Let's put it this way. Yeah. So, to well, there's there's a couple of them in Africa. I want to play a w- game with you later. The overvalued and the undervalued countries, but we'll get there. Maybe some real <laughs> undervalued countries for for oh, that are not oh. very challenging. Um, and, and, I mean, you don't have to be super experienced to get there. So, yeah, exactly. So, so uh, I want to spread a little bit geographically. So instead of uh, giving you more African ones, because I, I know a couple of African ones, which are, uh, I think, undervalued and unknown and surprisingly good. Um, I will go to the South Pacific, completely different region. Uh, and I would, uh, and there's several countries there, but I would probably name uh, Kiribati, which is, um, I don't think it's very well known as a tourist destination. And it is actually, yeah, it's, but this goes for much of the, for, for the South Pacific region. It's, it's so underdeveloped. There's a, probably apart from Fiji, um, there is really not much tourism to speak of. There is, um, the downside is that the, the tourist infrastructure is, 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 is not fully developed, obviously, because they, they, well, there's hotels, but um, you don't have a choice like you would have in, 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 in tourist countries or tourist destinations, but um, Boris, are we are uh, we talking about Kiribati? Just, just yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, 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 okay. yeah. Well, okay, so I will explain. Uh, every word ending in uh, "ti" is uh, it's pronounced "s." So oh, okay. uh, yeah. <laughs> so um, so the thing is, Kiribati or yeah, Kiribati, as you as you write it, is is it consists of like huge atoll groups. Um, so if you look at it on the map, it's like, it's huge. It's, uh, I'm not sure if it's as big as Europe, but it's, it's like a, a really huge surface. Obviously, most of that is ocean. Um, uh, and, and they're one of those famous countries uh, supposedly disappearing um, under the sea level in, in, in a couple of decades. But um, um, so what I did was I unexpectedly had more time than I thought I cared about because of a, of, of a canceled flight. So I went to one of the outer atolls and, and like, this is really like paradise because there's, there's, they're absolutely not used to seeing any foreigners. So, uh, so you walk, I walked, compl- I walked the whole island uh, and almost every house I passed, people would stop me and yeah, please come inside. And then they would send their son up up to a up in a coconut tree to get a coconut for me <laughs> and then <laughs> they would just talk to, because they speak yeah. english so you can you can communicate with them so uh, and they're all i mean they, they, they're just super super relaxed and they, they live in a, a completely um separate world i mean the, 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 it's hard for us to imagine that you can uh that you can live so far from from the world that we know far from yeah you know, pollution, noise, whatever we have, they have nothing. They just catch their fish, they 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 eat dinner, and then <laughs> the next day brings more of the same. So 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 it's very laid back. Um, uh, I was fortunate because they have these these uh, traditional houses made of uh, local. Uh, everything is made of local um, uh, wood uh, trees that they find, for mostly palm trees, of course. So. Um, and the, the the funny thing is that I I met a guy on the far north and he um, he gave me a branch on my uh, on my head and he said that I had the blessing of of a, a sea goddess <laughs> and then so then we ended up talking and he obviously he asked me why where are you from and I said well I'm from the Netherlands uh, he didn't have a clue uh, even though I tried to say you know cheese windmills football whatever but he he just looked at me like I I no idea so i told yeah. him well maybe, maybe maybe you know like uh united kingdom or france or germany like bigger countries and 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 he he kind of uh knew the names so but then he asked me how long is it to sail from from holland to germany and i i looked at him like well you don't have to sail you just <laughs> you just go by car by train whatever and uh, but he couldn't understand and then he he goes like Okay, so how many hours to sail from from Netherlands to France? And I said, well, same thing. You you can just cycle to France. I mean, you can you you can go over land. But then first I thought, well, this guy is really <laughs> lacking education because he doesn't know his geography. 
And and then after a while, I, I it dawned on me that he he lives in on an island, in a region where, where identity is basically defined by your island. So and even the bigger countries in the region are Japan or Philippines or Australia or New Zealand. It's all island nations. So so in the end, I I, I realized like th this guy lives in a completely different um, uh, world than I do. And um, I tried to explain to him like if if I if I want, I can travel from, from Netherlands to China without ever having to, 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 to get into any ocean or sea. And he, he just, he just <laughs> looked at me like, well, you're crazy. <laughs> yeah. That's fascinating and, because it's, it's, it's a level of the, his mental model of the world is so different that it, I mean, it's incorrect, right? It's kind of like our model of the universe, right? I feel that's what, that's how we think about the universe. We, well, we have this model because we think about that and that's what we read in the book last 100 years. But maybe it's completely different, right? If someone would tell us differently, we'd be like, yeah, hmm, you're just a conspiracy theorist, right? Or we, we would just ignore it because it's just not what's in the mainstream right now. Well, I, I ended up thinking like, maybe he's right. Maybe it's really crazy. Why would there be a border between Holland and Germany? Because perhaps... For him, it's just the same kind of land. Why would you draw a line on a, on a piece of land? And why would anyone decide that this is yours and that's mine? <laughs> For yeah. him, it's like, this is our island and we live here with so many families and, and that's it. And, and, yeah. this is, and we, we, this is the language you speak, blah, blah, blah. So this is our identity, full stop. And, and so I ended up thinking like, you know, all, all the borders we have in Europe and or in Africa, they're, they're all man-made, of course. So so. Uh, so it makes much more sense to say, well, okay, this is the island, and th this island is called whatever, and then and 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 these are our rules, and um, you're welcome to visit us, but but to please respect what we um, th the way we want to live. Yeah, have you and, and, have you ever done a, a, a wider trip into the French Polynesian islands? Because they 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 show me when I was there, they told me, oh, this is as big as Europe, and there's all these islands. But they're really far out. You either have to fly to them, or you have to bring your own yacht that you know can go all over the Pacific. I found this very interesting, but almost impossible logistically to to pull it off. Yeah, no, I, I did not. And uh, and you're right. I think the only way this is what I realized. I, so I had three months to travel um, uh, the South Pacific uh, because there's uh, there's quite a few countries, uh, UN countries. So. Um, uh, and at first, I thought three months is a, is, is is a pretty long period, but it turns out three months is nothing for <laughs> for such a huge region. And I actually ended up because I I somehow naively thought I could I could take boats between or ships between islands, but it's just way too big. So so and and then there's no regular ferry services or anything. So you 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 end up flying unless, as you say, unless you have your own yacht, your own transportation. That would be. Um, that would be fantastic because that that region uh seriously is 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 much of it is completely unexplored yeah uh, and if you would have your own yacht you can you can but you're not totally free because you need to clear customs and immigration and everything but uh yeah you could that would probably be the only way to really see it yeah the south pacific isn't or the whole Pacific has big waves, so you can't just go on your little yachts. It needs to bring, you need to bring something that you know even works outside yep. the Mediterranean. Um, <laughs> it's, a, it's a different environment. So you either you have need... that kind of investment um, ready to go, or I think what what was a short shortcut, but it's not the same way to explore it. Is um, I forgot the name of the the domestic airline in French Polynesia. They sell an all access pass. I think it's a thousand fifteen hundred dollars. And then for 30 days, you can go to wherever you want as long as you want. So that's kind of cool. Um, it's not as good as, yeah. as seeing it from a boat, but it's it's a start. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. And if you if you have your yacht, you really need to you you need to know what you're doing. The other option would be to try to if you have a lot of time on your hands, would be to um, uh, to try um, hitch rides with with others because some, especially if you pick the right season, you might be able to find. Um, uh, yachts going somewhere and they 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 might you know want to have you on board for probably some doing some work and, and everything but um you need to improve your russian for this russian yeah because oh, russian you, you think... that's what i would expect right i have no uh, idea if they show up in french well, I, I 
I, 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 so, well, I, so I'm, so, I'm not talking about French Polynesia, but I, I, in the South Pacific, I actually met, um, I mostly met Norwegians with yachts. Okay. Friendly, okay. No, because Norwegians obviously are, <laughs> Norwegians obviously are also pretty rich, so because they have all their, their own money, so, so they, yeah. um, so yeah, for some reason, I, I ended up seeing lots of Norwegian, even though Norway is a pretty small country, but they, they were overrepresented in, in the South Pacific. <laughs> well, sometimes there is this, this just curious marketing, and maybe it's more viral. So there, I know that from Germany, where I grew up, there were certain destinations in the world um, that were very well known, and they were everyone wanted to go there. So obviously, one of the it's Mallorca down in Spain that was very well known. Even though there's tons of other islands around it, there's tons of places in Spain itself that people had no idea they even existed. And also, weirdly enough, uh, people in Germany, for instance, would think of Dubai and Abu Dhabi as beach destinations. Mm -hmm. They think of it, it's very popular, and if it's winter, you have to go there. But A, the beaches are not great, um, they're decent, but B, it's relatively expensive, it's not a beachy place at all. Um, and C, it's really cold in winter. Well, relatively cold um, if you really think of a beach holiday. So it's kind of, I don't know where this happened, but it's like everybody knows that. And you, you it, it's its very futile to convince people otherwise because they will think, oh, this is what everyone does. And I don't know if this is a European thing. It's not as strong in the US, but we have that too, right? We have a certain view of Mexico that everyone shares, even though Mexico is in so many different places and, 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 and areas and that you can't really compare. Probably yeah. something like that happened in Norway, but French Polynesia. Maybe. Yeah. Do you have another one for us? I, those were two really, really interesting. I, I've never heard of those two places in that context. Um, well, probably another one coming to mind probably is a surprising one as well, which right now is completely, even disregarding the pandemic is inaccessible, is, is Yemen. Yeah. Uh, I I had a, a really really uh, I was really touched by 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 the people in Yemen, um, especially. So I visited 2004, so that was way before the war started. But it has it has always been a turbulent country, of course. So uh, so before I went, people were like worried. They were why are you going to Yemen? I uh, I I knew some people who went there, and they were really. Um, uh, positive about Yemen, so I went there myself, and it, I, I I really found it's like a really really uh, almost forgotten country where, um, uh, as you said before, like compared to Egypt, where you so the first day I walk in in Sana on on the on the market, and I was expecting people to to walk after me, like come have a cup of tea, blah blah blah, and then they sell you your their carpet or their whatever they have, their brassware. Well, you, you know what I'm talking about. Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> and and the funny thing is that people actually did ask me in their shop, and then after, so so we were talking, and then I just when I was expecting them to say, well, why don't you buy my stuff, they would say, well, you you must be in a hurry because you came here to see our country, so please uh, uh, feel free to go ahead and explore more of the city. So they never, no one ever. Like I would, I traveled around for for almost four weeks, and no one ever tried to sell me anything. They they were just generally uh, happy to see foreigners. They were they were treating me everywhere to dinner to whatever. So, so I, I I was really really impressed and touched by by the the generosity of of Yemen, uh, Yemeni people who also back then were were super poor. I mean this is this is like in the whole Arabian Peninsula, uh, Yemen is obviously. Uh, by far the poorest uh, because they have, uh, I, I'm not even sure they had any oil, a little bit, I think, but um, they are much worse off, uh, especially now since, what is it, 2011 or 12, when they, uh, uh, when their current war started, um, they are, um, I, I, yeah, I feel for them because they, they deserve better, but, uh, but yeah, before the war and uh, as soon as the war is over, I'm sure they will be welcoming um, uh, visitors again. But it was, um, uh, and then apart from the people, there's so many things to see. The they, they have like mountains, they have desert, they have um, obviously they have the, uh, the a, a pretty long coastline, um, and all these traditional uh, towns, and and even Sana itself. It's like the whole uh, city center of Sana is is one one big UNESCO. Um, uh, World Heritage of Sites, so it's it's uh, yeah, it's really beautiful. Yeah, that was definitely and, not on my list as well. Um, so I'm I'm, I'm <laughs> really surprised you put this on. 
it's kind of off limits right now. Um, what, well, what yeah, unfortunately. Like? Yeah, go ahead. Well, yeah, I, I know I know people who uh, I even know people who went there recently, uh, but but right now much of the country is off limits, and you can you can more as as far as I understand, you can bribe your way into um, uh, into Yemen from uh, Oman, uh, which will cost you a lot of money. You can spend like maybe two or three days, and then you need to uh, you need to get out. Uh, you you can you, I think you can see a few places, but you you cannot reach Sana. You cannot much of the country is, is just unreachable unless you are maybe a journalist or something but um for, for a regular visitor it's 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 off limits plus dangerous of course so so yeah. Um, so yeah something that changes now, you know like iraq which came back relatively soon let's put it this way so it's not exactly a place where you should go for a summer vacation when you've never been outside the country but it's a place that seems accessible enough for most experienced travelers now which is great uh, one place that i saw on your list um is madagascar and ah. <laughs> I felt Madagascar was was one of those countries that I expected in a certain way, but it was completely different. So like I constantly had to readjust, readjust every day to to deal with 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 this um, with this place. I only made it. I had about a week to um, to the capital to An 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 Rivo. I never made it to the coastline, which are spectacular. And I think we have all seen seen um, the, the recent Grand Tour episode really um, showed it very prominently, but there's lots of other movies and, and, and videos. Um, what's your, what are your thoughts about Madagascar? Um, I thought, well, it's, it's, it, it was my second last country to visit before my last country. Um, so I, I, I I, I kept it for last because I uh, I was really looking forward to seeing it. So I, I I wanted the best for last, so to say. And I was um, it's it's super big. So I only had um, I think a little bit less than four weeks, uh, and you cannot you can just not see the country in four weeks. So I will it, it's high on my list to be to to revisit. Um, the thing is, what I found. One of the things I found really um, fascinating is that the first day in Antananarivo, um, I was like, "Is this part of Africa?" Because because people just don't look like Africans. They 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 are like. Um, uh, then I found out that many like the high the upper class is, is is they're basically descendants from Indonesian people, so they're from 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 Asian descent. So um, and then when you when you come to the west coast, it's it's. Much more like African uh, African countries because because there's many African people. Um, obviously, their nature is is absolutely stunning. I mean, they they have so much variety. Uh, obviously, they have a lot of uh, endemic species uh, animals which are um, which only live in Madagascar. So so um, uh, I liked it a lot. Um, at the same time, I did find a few places where um uh how to put this in a nice way they were <laughs> they were they were on their way to getting too touristy yeah uh and uh, yeah, there's, so a, there's, of, an, there's an island right and it's yeah pretty famous now in europe yeah 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 and, i had some um, of the best food some of the worst food ever in andantana rivo uh which really struck me i had some of the best value things I did, I think, in that time with some of the worst. So it was was really difficult for me to, to adjust to some really beautiful areas up on the hills in the city. Um, you could be in any little French town. It's beautiful and it's quiet. Exactly. And, yeah. and the accommodation is better than most places in France. It's stunning, good quality. And then the next hotel, which looked good on the pictures, is, is a total dump. And you, you feel like you're, you're, you're in Lagos, but in a bad neighborhood in Lagos. So the, <laughs> the, the differences I experienced during my time were, were pretty stunning. And um, the, it just didn't work with, with the set of expectations I've built um, going to so many different places. I kind of draw up a picture and then I hope it's it's going to help me, right? It's just, a, I mean, I, I continuously adjust it. But in Alantana Rio, I could never, this would never work. It was completely different, which was great as it was very surprising. It was a very interesting destination, but also challenging. Things are extremely slow and like the Grand Tour showed, the roads basically don't exist. Like a like the yeah, no. it's it's not even a dirt path, <laughs> and they, they have no. there's a road that is a national national road that would would allow for trucks and buses to go through. And you're like, this is not going to work because there's simply no space. So that's also weird that you have to plan four weeks for a country that isn't that big in the end, 
but there's literally no roads and there's also no no ring road so you always have to go back to Anantana river which makes a trip that would only be two or three hundred miles makes it suddenly a thousand miles uh yep yeah one week is not enough <laughs> no <laughs> and no. and the well it, that was never but, that was never i would never be be able to see the whole place but it was good enough for no, the city well, i felt i had a good feeling of the yeah city sure yeah, yeah 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 that's all yeah, I but that's like but as I told you, even four weeks is not enough. I mean, it's 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 yeah. really it, it's, the going is very slow. Uh, as you said, the roads are, are horrendous. Um, it's probably probably in my top ten worst roads <laughs> worldwide. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, <laughs> depending on where you go, I think East Coast and, is the uh, worst. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, sure. But but yeah, there's few good roads. But I think as far as I remember, most roads were were terrible. But um, and then it depends what you want to do because you can you can you can i mean there's so many that's what i like in madagascar there's so many things so many options for, for to explore you can you can go diving you can go canoeing you can go we, we did um we went down one of the main rivers uh for a couple of days by kayak uh, and camping on the on the beaches and every on, on the side uh which is great but obviously it it, 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 it takes time and then um uh, you can go to the west coast. You can go to the south, to the east coast, to the north, uh, and they're all different. So it's uh, and then depending also on the season. So it's you you really have to plan it pretty well and and allow for spare time because I uh, I never we we didn't take domestic flights um, because we prefer to travel overland. I I know people who tried, but there's a, apparently there's a lot of hiccups and cancellations. So so you really need to plan and to allow for a wide margin of error <laughs> because yeah. things might just not work out the way you think they will. That ex was exactly my, my impression there as well. <laughs> Give me an idea how you plan these trips. So I looked at your website, which is again, really, really spectacular in s for certain countries more than others. Um, but I would say for most countries, you really go into detail. I really only looked at Africa and Asia because this is where my remaining countries are. Um, and I, I was curious, how do you research and how do you plan these trips? So you, you seem to be having everything in between one day trips or literally just a few hours to two, three, four weeks where you go everywhere across the country. How do you, how do you come up with a plan for a country? Like, well, what's your, what's your workflow that you go through? So, yeah, so once, once again, the one day trips is, is that's for work, but, um, sure. uh, and to address your question, I, I, I or your, your remark, um, I know some countries are underrepresented, uh, and I, uh, that's probably because I visited them because before I really started taking pictures and everything. So um, I'm, I'm hoping to, uh, when travel is, is, is possible again, to, to revisit some of those to um, expand because, you know, I'm, the whole site is done by myself. So it's, you can only do so much. But um, so as far, as far as the research is concerned, I would, I'm, I'm, I think I'm a pretty conventional guy. I, st I still um, read travel guides <laughs> for inspiration. Uh, I use the, the, the internet, of course. Um, I, am a, uh, I am on EPS, uh, Every Passport Stamp. It's a pretty big Facebook group for, uh, for extreme travelers or well, extreme for, for travelers. And you can get lots of um, uh, info there, which is actually, uh, which is very often up to date info because because it has I'm not sure how, how many but I think around ten thousand um, members so uh, surprisingly there's always someone who happens to be in uh, in Mogadishu today or there's always someone who happens to be in in, in Brazil or in Bolivia or in anywhere so so and well these are obviously uh, easy countries but if if you if you need like the latest on visa information, on, on access, on whatever um, uh, climate, on whatever you want to know, you you can you can um, you can get your information there. So um, so so, and, but that's mostly for practical stuff, not not so much for planning. So so yeah. So then I would I would I would read and then I would try to um, uh, make an estimate how how long it would take to um, uh, to see the things I want to see. Uh, and that can be anything. I'm I'm um, I'm very much into nature, very much into hiking. So um, uh, then, obviously, it de really depends on the country. Um, like talking about Madagascar, I, I I don't think I did much of hiking there because it's just 
yeah, it, it's a country where there's so much to do and to see that that was my priority. Um, so it, yeah, it's 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 hard to to give a, like a a a, uh, a a like a firm uh, plan outline for every country because it, it really depends on the country. So it, it probably would develop. Uh, as I as I gain more information, as I read more things about a country, I would I would know. Okay, this is a country for for nature. This is a country for where I need to see subcultural sites or his, historic historic sites. Um, and then, um, uh, as I said before, lately these last years, I'm I'm trying to avoid uh, overly visited places, so I might just skip them, um, just to to. You know, not to annoy myself. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so, 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 yeah. Is 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 that a clear enough answer? Or yeah, I was hoping you have another nugget there uh, for us. You know, like Sao Tommy and Prince of it's something that I never, never uh, expected the same way. It is obviously, you know, it is. There's a bunch of 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 things that so, people put so, together in order to make a decision, right? So do you make the, yeah. you, for your research was relatively easy because you knew there's the, there's the list, right? So I need to go down that list. So let's, let's plan it out. Well, I think for a lot of people, the list in their lifetime is relatively small and they're trying to find out what is in these 30 countries. It doesn't have to be countries, right? Places that they haven't been to. The question is, do I go to a place that I've been before because I liked it and maybe it's still that good, uh, even post pandemic. Or the other option is you go to something completely new, which gives you this anxiety of, especially if you're not as curious as we are or other travelers are, right? Um, if you, or extreme travelers, as they are sometimes called, um, a lot of people develop an anxiety. And as more information they can put their hands on, and as easier it seems, as more likely is it that they will actually travel there. Now, often the marketing that plays a role there too. So it's it's not necessarily hardcore facts. It's more an emotional connection that people have with the country. And the problem often is that once an, one of these campaigns goes viral, a lot of people have the same connection and they all end up in something that they didn't want, right? So they kind of spoil it for each other. I have the same problem. So it, I, I feel for most people, it's hard to to bookmark these dirty places they really want to go go to. And I think what, what they end up doing is they just use these emotional templates that are already known in in that region, in that country, wherever they live. And they say, oh, well, my friend went to Mexico and she wasn't marked, so it should be fine. It's cheap. Let's go. So I think the the decision matrix, I, I was hoping there is one, you know, something that people are overlooking. and. Uh, obviously, I, I've never heard of that Facebook group, so that sounds like a great way to really go to the, the last countries, right? To, to get an idea how, how difficult it is right now. Um, I was hoping there is, there is good advice we can give people what actually helps a little bit to see, you know, how touristy a place really is or how dangerous a place really is. How likely is it that you're going to get marked? How likely is it that your immigration office will not work the way um, you think it is? And um, it, something like... Um, you know, the McDonald's index, I don't know who came up with this, but he said the golden arches where we have McDonald's in two countries, they won't go to war. And so far it holds true. So it's pretty amazing. I think someone came up with this in the 60s and it hasn't been broken in 60 years. So that's pretty spectacular. So maybe there's one of those shortcuts also for countries. Maybe if you see one thing, then you say, okay, it's good to go if you have a little bit of experience. Cool. Um, well, I wanted to I wanted to add to my previous because you mentioned Sao Tome again, uh, and, and uh, which made me realize that um, uh, I only plan so much before going anywhere because I, I I mostly leave many things open until I arrive, and then uh, I think that's the best way to assess uh, both the situation, um, if, if applicable, also the security situation, uh, and just talking to locals uh, gives you lots of um, input as well. Um, yeah. And um, what 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 it it reminds me of a when I was um, when I was very young, a long time ago when I started traveling by myself, I was sitting on a train in Europe, uh, and I heard a couple of Americans uh, talking between themselves and uh, about it was their first visit to Europe and they were um, uh, really excited, and they were like, yeah, we need to go here, we need to go there, and then they they ended up talking about um, 
the, the, the most dangerous place of Europe. And they, they decided, they unanimously decided Amsterdam was really a place to avoid. And um, back then I, I was living in Amsterdam and I was, so I was listening to them like, what are you talking about? You're talking about my, <laughs> you're talking about my city. And I don't think Amsterdam is, is dangerous at all. I mean, it's uh, sure if you're unlucky, you, you can get mugged or whatever, but, but, um, but, but I really, I, I mean, unless you're unlucky, it's, it's fine. You can, you can go out in the night. There's, there's, there's really hardly any, 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 uh, uh, any bad crime or anything. So, um, so that made me realize that how all, all these, all these warnings and, and, you know, um, uh, uh, people say, yeah, you need to be cautious because it's, uh, it's, 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 it's not good out there and um, the blah, blah, blah. This is all very, um, uh, subjective and it's it's really like and 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 very often people just uh, copy what they hear and they say oh I heard blah 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 and then before you know it uh, a place has a very uh, bad name like I, I went to um, uh, Colombia in 2009 um, and back then Colombia was con still considered very dangerous and I traveled around I, I felt totally safe uh, also because people were taking care of me they were telling me yeah, you might want to avoid that in that neighborhood, but you know, if, as long as you stay here, it's fine. And people, I, I, so I actually felt safe because I felt that people were uh, keeping an eye on me, and and they wanted me to be safe. Because, um, so what I'm trying to say is, w once a place or a country or a region uh, has acquired a certain reputation, it's very hard to to get rid of it because. Um, I think the same happened, for instance, to New York. New York had a had a, a reputation of being super dangerous, like what 10, 20 years ago, they had high crime rates and they had so many people dying every week. Probably a little bit what, what's happening to Chicago right now. A friend of mine- uh, Yeah, but I mean, I mean, American cities are very special in that regard. Uh, for instance, right now we have a very huge crime wave and for the standards that we're used to, like here in San Francisco, right? So it's 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 still, it's it's always the question: What's the base level you compare it to? So I give you, um, I, I give you that. But on the other hand, the American cities, a bit like Madagascar, they are from one neighborhood where you you're almost guaranteed going to get mocked to the next one where you can sleep on the street and you can you don't even have to lock your cars. Um, and this is only like in the I know a couple of miles south here. East Palo Alto was one of the most dangerous cities um, in the U.S. with the highest murder rate. All, all, all traffic that was related to gangs, but, you know, you can be in a crossfire and there's lots of other yes. spreading out crime. And literally just 200 yards to the border is Palo Alto, which is one of the richest and uh, the, the safest um, city in the whole U.S. So, uh, as a, but as a traveler, as a foreigner, you have no clue if you're in Palo Alto, East Palo Alto. It's not even a sign. I mean, you kind of see the neighborhood, but it's impossible for someone to realize, I mean, it's not impossible, but if you don't have the education it's, as a traveler, I think yeah. it's very difficult. Like my own family, if, if they would come visit, they wouldn't know. They have no idea of this, how diverse these neighborhoods can be and how dangerous they can be or how safe they can be. They don't see the signs. I wouldn't worry a minute. Um, and I think the same is true for Colombia. Like Medellin had really bad neighborhoods, but if you know where they are and if you have an eye for them, it's extremely easy to avoid them and you're fine. You can go run at midnight and you're going to be okay. So that's really difficult to, to acquire that knowledge. And because we are these hive people, right? Most people don't get out of their comfort zone. They, they are not, now they haven't left home in a year. They have no clue and they don't have real, a, a real incentive to develop that, that knowledge, which is strange, but I think that makes world, the world more dangerous to them. Um. I, be, I believe it's it's also a matter of um, uh, of getting more experience. And uh, for instance, you can um, what I do when I arrive somewhere is uh, where I know you know there might be problems. I I ask around uh, locals, and uh, because local as you as you say, oh you're let's say you're a local, right? And you can you can tell me like okay, this area of San Francisco is fine. This area don't go there because it's really not good. Uh, so, so I think that's 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 one thing. The second thing is you um, uh, you learn to uh, to be very aware of your surroundings. So I I always look. Uh, I have a lot of things. It I might not even be able to um, to 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 name them to you because because I think it's it's even unconscious. But I I have a lot of ways to 
uh, to assess what is happening around me. To that's to see because we have you on. You're the expert, but I think it's it's intuition that you learn that you don't have when you're 18. But, I don't think I had it when I was 18. I was lucky I didn't but, get shot when I went to a lot of places. But that's that's exactly what I'm saying. That this is an experience you need to gain, and you you cannot buy it. You you need to. Yeah. Uh, to learn the hard way, and I, I'm I'm doing things now that I would never have done 20 years ago, yeah. simply for the same reason. I, 20 years ago, I would I wouldn't have dreamt of going to Afghanistan or you know any of these countries because I would I, I thought that was way that was just out of the way, uh, and and now, you know, I've done it, and I'm like, okay, well, things are different on the ground, and. Uh, and you deal with it, but but absolutely, you, you're absolutely right. This is this is something you need to um, um, you need to acquire. And um, so I would, yeah, I would definitely not advise an 18 year old <laughs> to to just go anywhere and you know. <laughs> yeah. Even but even though I even though I know people, I know I know uh, I think he's 21 years old. The guy in uh, he, he's also an EPS, um, uh, and he's been. Uh, by himself, he's been to Syria lately. He's been to a lot of, uh, well, let's say dicey countries. Would, uh, and and apparently he survives. He. <laughs> well, you always can get lucky, right? So it's like the stock market. And you, and you, the, you can make billions um, just going whatever you put everything, all your money into Tesla calls, and you rich or on Bitcoin. But the problem is that as longer you play, it's more likely it's going to be devastating for you, and it's not just devastating financially. Being really rich and then losing it in a few months is really devastating for your soul. You got to be really careful what you're playing with. And as an 18 year old, you have no clue, but you can just get lucky. That's fine. But, but to your point earlier, what you said, I, I, in my own travel experience, I found the, the dicey countries, maybe because of my mental awareness and because of the research that I would do before I go, I found them generally completely safe. I never had any issues, um, immigration issues like Uzbekistan, who was really strict for the longest time, or Russia. They were strict when I was there, but they went, I mean, to the letter. Like, they never gave me any problems because I was, you know, making sure it's correct. But then I was in Sri Lanka, which you would feel like nobody cares um, about immigration at all because of millions of tourists every year. And I was in a jail cell, and none of this was my fault, right? So someone stole my passport numbers, and my passport mm. was fake, and I was a terrorist. And I'm like, no, why don't you call the consulate? And then eventually they called the consulate, and they let me go. But it's in a country where I never thought that would even be an option, right? So I would expect that in, in places where, you know, there's political animosities or I would be, I was warned to go there and in many places in Africa, like Cameroon, I never had any issues. Maybe because I anticipated them and maybe I made sure it doesn't happen. Yep. Well, the other uh, very true thing you just mentioned is, is uh, and it, this sounds super um, uh, obvious, but it's just like, if you're unlucky, you're just well. You can be unlucky. I mean, it, it, and and it can happen anywhere. And um, as I, I as I was saying, I, I I just finished writing my book, and I, in in uh, in it, I I I look back on all my travels, and I I ask myself like, so which were, in hindsight, which were really the most dangerous situations I I was in, and it, it was it was not in Iraq or Afghanistan or Somalia, but it was in completely unexpected situations and places which just happened for some reason i was unlucky or 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 you know uh, something happened uh, unforeseen uh, and and this can happen anywhere yeah actually i i, I lost um i lost four uh, travel friends they 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 died uh, at a pretty young age uh, they were all travelers and all four of them died in in really almost stupid situations where they were just uh they were in a safe situation well apart from one of them but they were in a safe normally safe situation but they were just super unlucky for things to turn bad and and, and for them actually to 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 pass away so so yeah what happened to them can can you share well well two of them um they were they were a canadian couple and um i met them when i was still pretty young so they were my they were one of my travel inspirations because they, they traveled a lot to, to countries I had never heard of. They, they actually, they were one of the uh, people who advised me to go to Yemen. Um, and they went there, I think, in the, in the 1980s. So that was really, <laughs> uh, I think, even before they, they, they unified. 
um, they went to Uzbekistan in the 80s. They went to all these these places that I was like, what? Wow. wow. <laughs> so so then one day they um, um, so they travel to all these places. Everything is fine. One day they they have a weekend in uh, they, they're from Canada, so they go uh, on a kayaking kayaking trip on a sunny Sunday, you know, like your average something to do on Sunday. And then suddenly the weather turns uh, sour and there, there's big waves on the lake and they, they, they capsize and they, they, they were never, well, the, the body of my friend was found a few weeks later and um, his wife was never even found anymore. So, so just to say they were really super unlucky and th this was really an accident that, that, yeah, should not have happened. Um, yeah. And and after after all the things they did, it was it was like, uh, it was really sad to 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 like really like a kayaking, a few hour kayaking trip in Canada. <laughs> uh, they, yeah. yeah. It's it's tragic. What what were your personal situations where you were kind of after you went through them, you you were holding back and said, oh my gosh, that was pretty close. So I either suffered with my life, or could have suffered with my life, or I could have suffered injuries, um, or it's something that gave me really grave financial loss. Did you have those situations? And then how often do, did they happen? Uh, well, not, not, not financial loss, but I... Um... Uh, yeah, well, that, that's another strange story. I was, I was, <laughs> I came home from a flight actually from Canada, uh, like, uh, I don't know, 20 years ago, I, I was walking home and um, I, uh, I had an, I had a new iPod. So this is how long ago it is. I had an iPod. So I was listening to music. Uh, it was also a Sunday morning. I was walking home, uh, no one on the streets. And I was just like 10 minute walk from my home. I was, um, uh, I heard, I was walking on the bridge and I heard like this, the, the sound of a car breaking. And I, in a reflex, I, I looked behind me and I see this car. And, and this is a street where, uh, which is car free. So the car wasn't supposed to be there. But uh, so I looked around and I see the car. He, he breaks the fence of the bridge and he falls into the, into the canal. Um, so I'm like, I, I immediately realized, like, if, if my train would have been um, five seconds late, I would have been walking 10 meters behind, and I, this car would have completely killed me, and then it would have pushed me in the canal <laughs> with my suitcase. Yeah. Um, so I, I called 11, uh, or 911, uh, 112 in Europe, but um, for the police and everything, of, uh, and of, of course the, the guys were, uh, were, were rescued, uh, they, they were... Uh, scuba divers to to rescue the car and the drivers and um, uh, or the passengers of the car and uh, but I was like, you know, this could have been the end because <laughs> yeah. if 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 I would have walked a little bit more slowly or or anything because I didn't hear anything I was just listening to my music and and I only heard the car because well you know this this sound of a car like completely out of control and it was trying to break but this the the bridge is in a bend so he couldn't make make the bend so he just crashed the the fence and uh, disappeared in, in, into the water so that was actually one of the closest things i uh, and this is just like 10 minute 10 minutes walk from from my home <laughs> so traveling actually saved so, you from other incidents like that uh well another Isn't thing interesting, what, right how life sometimes works I, I i find that quite quite strange how we that's one of my observations that really puzzles me, but I, I, it's, it's still the same. When we, when we live in a certain place, we call it home, we are comfortable, and we worry going somewhere else is a bad idea because it has come with risk. So, and we feel like, well, Europe and the US are kind of similar, right? I mean, there's differences, but they're really, really similar. And then, but this also applies to someone who lives in Lahore, someone who lives in Abuja, they also feel it's very dangerous to go somewhere else. And we were like, well, you mastered that city that we consider extremely dangerous for all kinds of reasons. But it, it doesn't work that way. So you just because you mastered the security situation because of it, and it's a data problem, right? Because you, you, you mastered it in one area, doesn't mean you can apply the same algorithm in your head to the next area. And it is, I mean, once you've been to all the countries, and I guess you, you, you don't have any worries with this, but if you go to all these places, there's always another place 
that's different and that scares most people and maybe for good reasons because there is definitely a risk involved right so you have to make this trade-off between exploration curiosity and risk reduction i guess this is a good one right so a lot of people err on the side of the risk is too high and i think this is what 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 made us survive for the longest time if we would be on the side of let's take that risk and uh, let's kill that huge animal, we would all be dead because these animals don't die just because we want to kill them, right? So we would have to reduce risk until to a level when it becomes really easy and we feel very confident. And typically, this, those are other people telling us it's safe and they have done it. And that seems to be something that really helped us in the past. So I think it's it's good from an from a ancestral point of view that we have that. And I'm not sure what's going on, you know, when you, when you think of social media and you think of what how people portray their own life that is so far away from reality. Like we have this in San Francisco where I feel that people have gone cloud early and cloud only a lot. So they literally only live in the cloud. They don't live in their neighborhood anymore. They couldn't care less what's going on outside the street. There could be a hundred homeless people in tents. They would never talk to them. But if someone puts a post on Twitter uh, a thousand miles away, they would go ballistic. Um, it's a very odd way to what happened that people are living and they're they're consciously retreating into their own realities that have nothing to do with the, with, the, with the real reality. Well, maybe it's also a chosen reality because you choose your neighborhood, you choose all these places. And the travel seems to be the, the way to escape, right? It's this escapism. So if you can't travel because of travel restrictions right now or because you, you don't have the money or you don't have the, 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 the ideas where you should go, people just go to the cloud. I think this is the new form of travel. People just cloudify themselves and just live as cloud beings, so to speak. They live on their apps and they watch Netflix and they have their curated lists. What do you think is the role of technology and travel in that sense? I mean, as a, as a way to replace travel, A, um, which seems to have happened in the last 12 years, or B, how they enhance travel, but they also distract a lot of people from while they travel. Uh, so yeah. So first, first I want to address the the other thing you you pointed out. I I think that um, um, at least in in the West we have become. Uh, I, I I believe we have to come. We have become too much risk aware. So and I mean to say that um, we we seem to think, or at least some people seem to think that they can reduce risk to zero, and. Um, and I believe this doesn't exist. I mean, in life, there's all whatever you do, there is always a risk, and and then you you can quantify it. It's it's zero point one, or maybe it's a hundred, or somewhere in between. But you know, so 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 I think people are at least some people are obsessed with like I want to lead a riskless life, which I believe doesn't exist. And especially if you, if you talk, if we talk about travel like riskless travel also doesn't exist. I mean, you, you take a bus or a train or a car or any, any transportation, something can happen. And uh, on, on the way from, from your car to the, to the aircraft uh, in the airport or during the flight or you know anywhere, something can happen. You arrive at the destination, uh, something else can happen. So, so, so um, and, uh, and then to get to your second, uh, or to your real question about technology, um, uh, the other, it's it's an interesting question, and it's 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 something relatively new, right? Because w when when uh, when did we start traveling with our phone and um, uh, being um, uh, always connected to our loved ones? Like ten years ago, probably they started, but before that. If, when you would leave for traveling somewhere, you might, well, first we had email, but before email, you had to phone home to say, you know, I'm, I'm good, I'm okay, I'm going, I'm here, I'm going there, blah, blah, blah. And then you hung up and you, and you were on your own. And now you're, you're like almost continuously connected to, to almost anyone you want, which gives a completely different mindset because, and I think it gives a sense of, uh, probably a sense of safety as well, because you think, you know, I can always, if something happens, I can always um, uh, try to reach my friend or my 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 mother, my whatever, my my partner, my um, my sister, my brother, uh, to 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 help me out. Um, so so it might be that this this gives us confidence that we have um, 
uh, a backup plan or uh, something to fall back on to, 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 you know, we have a connection to an outside world, which before we didn't have. Um, but it might also be that we, which is what I sometimes see when I travel, you arrive somewhere and, and instead of exploring a place or a city, people are just <laughs> lounging in their, uh, on, on their sofas and they're just, um, uh, posting their uh, selfies on Instagram and 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 not not really bothering to to explore anymore. So so it's it's I think it's a mixed bag. Yeah, it, I feel. Does that answer your question? Or, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's it's not so easy, and I I feel for me the 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 iPhone and the maps they really they, they they've been fantastic. Like they gave me that safety that I can. If I download an offline map and I know where I am, um, and I started traveling without that, and I always find this very confusing. Not that I can't read maps, but there's certain places you can't buy them. They just they're not available. Um, whenever wherever you try, it takes forever to get them, and you still don't know where you are. Even and you can't. Uh, and there's places in India you ask people on the map, they've never seen the map, so they can't even help you. Nobody yeah, can help yeah. you, and they say, "Oh, it's that street where I live," but I don't know this cross streets because they don't have names. So yeah. it's. <laughs> Maps were not helpful in many places, but the downloaded map and that blue dot, I think that really changed my life as a traveler because I always know, okay, I can find my way back. And I, I had a really hairy situation in that big market in Ethiopia where people were following me and, and, and they tried to push me into this underground garage, but I knew Ooh. where I was going, so I, knew I was able to run away. But not just, you know, you can't really navigate easily in this place, but I knew where I had to go. I know the direction. So that maybe you could have done with a compass, but I really used my phone at that moment. So for me, it's been a lifesaver, so to speak, um, many, many times. Um, and obviously, it, it, that I'm not sure if that's, that's good or bad. I rely on the crowdsourced recommendations of other people. So I know about the right restaurants. I know about the places that people online really like. Now, this is a two, two-edged sword, at least. It, it gives you, it kind of drives me into the tourist ghetto because often these places are well reviewed because a lot of tourists put these t reviews online. The locals use a different app or they don't use an app at all. And I, I see myself being too convenient and too comfortable by just blindly following them sometimes because they're on the way anyways, instead of asking around and making a real connection. So you seem a very sociable guy. You seem, you, you seem like you, you, you've really developed these skills over the years that you need in order to make that connection. I, I'm I think I'm still working on those, and for me, it's a it's a quite a long journey to get there because it is it is uncomfortable. It, it seems inefficient, right? I'm also a tech guy. I know how all these tech works. I don't know how people work. Well, I know a little bit. I'm learning, and it's it's something where I feel myself. I'm more drawn to the technology app angle, and I don't really interact with people anymore. And I think this has happened to other people even more because they, they are not experienced travelers. And what happens is the, 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 there's two fronts. Right? Here in San Francisco, we had tons of tourists and everyone hated them, right? And they also they had the worst behavior and you could never really interact with them anymore because they either were on their apps, they were like on Lombard Street, they'd take some photos, upload them, and they're good to go two days later. So both sides of, were contributing to this problem. And I, 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 I caught myself more relying on technology than I wanted. And I felt it's hard to, to withdraw because what you do is you think, or I think that, maybe that's my own FOMO, someone that I see later on who had technology, used technology, seemed to have the same kind of experience, but minimal effort, and I was really jealous. So <laughs> I, I find it hard to wean myself off it. So yeah, so so this basically brings us to to what what you started with, right? You you were you were saying, you were you were looking for an anthropo anthropological view of of, of my travels, and um, yeah. uh, and I think this is a good a good example. I would I would I avoid um, uh, looking for uh, recommendations for restaurants or hotels or anything. I I would always like. Almost always go by by talking to locals and asking them, you know, what what is a good place to, what is your national dish, what is a good place to have it. I don't know. There's many ways to find out. Uh, and then you um, 
um, as as a side uh, as a side effect, you 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 get in, in touch with locals as well. So you can you can have a, probably a conversation about something else as well. But uh, and then in a the restaurant, I would always ask them like, what is the what is your best dish or your signature dish or what what do you advise and blah blah blah. So, um, uh, but but I totally see what you mean because because this is the way. Uh, travel has developed, right? You 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 <laughs> you you take out your phone, you have your map, you mark the the the, ho the hotels or the restaurants or or whatever or the sites that have been recommended by someone else, and you and you just follow that um, that line on your map, and you you tick those things off, and you have your din your lunch and your dinner and your ice cream and your coffee and whatever, and 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 then. Yeah. You basically copied someone else's footsteps, and um, yeah. and I'm very happy. I, mean, I have to admit, I mean, it's very comfortable, and, and the experience is great. I mean, I had restaurants and, that I thought are not sure. possible for for sure. pennies, and yeah, it's quite amazing. It's quite addictive. Exactly. So, 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 um, I mean, there's nothing wrong with it, but it's it's just. I think it, it all depends on what you want to get out of your travels and, 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 and this is what you yeah. want, then it's sure it's very comfortable. It's, it's much more efficient because you, 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 you can do more in, in less time because you, um, you don't have to ask around, you don't have to look for things. You just, well, you have to look at your phone. I mean, <laughs> so, I, I want to so get out of the tourist ghetto. Let's put it this way. And out of the traveler ghetto, I'm not, but, I want to be tourist. I want to move, yeah. move beyond that, but I found it fiendishly difficult sometimes. Um, and, um, uh, Maybe that's a recent experience. Maybe it's the last five years. Um, before that, I never had. But even when I traveled without phones, I never had that problem. Well, exactly. So I, I just wanted to say, ditch your phone and and and, and go. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and oh my god. Tra tra travel. I know. I know. Oh my god. Right. <laughs> and right. Tra travel. I don't think travel we can continue the, on that basis. <laughs> travel the old-fashioned way. Uh, no, I'm. I'm. But I'm. I'm actually tra traveling with two phones now. Uh, no kidding. Um, okay. There's a backup, but also because um, <laughs> I need them for the podcast. So I have two phones, laptops, iPads. So it's, it's kind of the opposite. But yeah, you're right. You're... Mm -hmm. But I think this is too cold turkey. I think there is, there's got to be a middle way. Um, I don't think the, we can just, we should be Luddite and just not use the technology that there is. And there's a lot of potential, right? So the, the ability to enhance things that technology has given us is clearly there. It's just sometimes or often we get it wrong the first time we try and then it takes a couple of boom and bust cycles. Eventually we work it out. Like TV was supposedly the worst drug ever, and nobody should watch any TV. Everybody watches what three, four hours of TV on average, um, and you can still say it's a drug, but it's not going away. Like it's you, you can you can dive in that belief that it's a bad thing, but it doesn't change the life of your children. So I'm trying to avoid this, right? So I'm trying to <laughs> become this negative negativity filled, and I understand that is often the problem in in human development is that the prior generation didn't have access to the same tools, but it, it developed a certain level of expertise that it made them, at least the ones who survived, or the ones that mastered it, they had an enormous amount of freedom and, and, and wealth and, and social recognition. But technology changes all this, right? So it takes away all the skills they had. It takes away all the level of recognition they had because now it's baked into silicon or steel or whatever it is, right? So it's all just, just a piece of technology. And that is really uncomfortable and it's for that generation, obviously, and sometimes the next generation doesn't necessarily has a better life immediately. It might take a few generations until the better life actually comes around. And I think this is where we are with, with the silicon stuff and with the AI. It can be so good at, at certain decisions, but it's only 99% there in many places. And uh, so the crowdsource stuff is a good idea, but you have to overlay it with real, real, real experiences and double check with people. So that's kind of my own solution right now. So I combine these two. Maybe I'm, this is not useful because obviously the, the, the digital information is more addictive than you get from people. I, I'm, I'm sometimes wondering if we are moving towards a, um, a way of travel where people, um, uh, they just stay home with their VR uh, on their heads, and they they just they just this <laughs> is well they, yes. they just well I'm yeah. I'm not sure, but if if I I think if if you would have told any any traveler thirty years ago like, you know people will be walking around with their phones and they will find uh, all the places they will take off uh, on on their list on their phone, 
they would have said, "Oh, that sounds terrible." <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, right. Yeah. So, 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 so I don't know. I mean, uh, th this was just a thought I had a few weeks ago. Like, will this be the future of travel? Like, you, you, you just uh, and and it, and it. I thought of it because of um, now during the pandemic, there's a few sites where you can or museums or there's a lot of places where you which you can now visit uh, uh, online. Right. So, so they're officially they're closed. Uh, and yeah. the only way to see their collection or their like we have this famous sort of flower um, uh, place in, in Holland, which is only open in, in uh, March, April, May with tulips and everything. And it, it was closed last year. There was no public, no audience. No one was allowed to enter. And the same will happen this year. So what they did last year is they opened it uh, online so you can still visit, but you can just you can have a virtual walk around the park <laughs> on your on your computer. And this is all. I mean, obviously, this is now because you know you cannot go there for real. But uh, I was wondering if if this might be, at least for some people, might be the future of travel. Like, like not everyone can can travel to Kiribati, for instance, or not everyone wants to travel to Mogadishu. So, so maybe you can just, you know, you can down, download your stuff. You can you can install yourself, uh, have a good wine or whatever you want to drink with it, and you and you uh, virtually visit um, visit this place without ever leaving your house i think that would definitely know. happen i mean that that would be an enhancement i i i and i think you do this too a lot of people started doing this with google street view right so before i go somewhere i go i look at google street view and by that i can kind of see is this a dangerous neighborhood or not i could look if there's big tall trees right um, dangerous neighborhoods usually don't have old trees um the exceptions apply like brazil has a lot of those and uh, so there's some markers I look at and then I see how, how these houses look like. Are they good in shape? Are they well maintained? Are they well kept? Um, that tells you it's better they kept is less likely. It's just a da dangerous neighborhood. And I think you can read a lot of those things from VR or any kind of screen experience. And I think this is, this is definitely a good thing. But in the end, and that's, that's a big if. I think the human experience is something that is it's so HD to us, right? So we, we perceive as, as the extreme fidelity of, of human connection. And um, in, in that's in relationship even to places that we go because we, 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 we interact with people, but we also want to see how they actually build a culture that is kind of a, a more abstract way of seeing people, right? So we, we, when we go to a museum, we say, oh, we look at things, but actually these things are done by the culture that's there. So it is an abstraction of, of, of what the locals have done, of their culture, and it's easily accessible. So we go to museums. We could also ask around, eventually get to the same place, but we use the technology of a museum, right? So we, we, we take the shortcut. And, but ultimately to our mind, I feel the human experience is what we crave. Um, and maybe that's why we are not lonely Neanderthals and we don't live by ourselves. We live in these huge hives of other people and we crave the social recognition. That's kind of the fuel pretty much for everyone out there. It, money is secondary. It's, it's good to have, but it's not really that important. But if you replace it with just a digital experience, I think it, it still needs to cover this human element, which is, I think, possible. It's just we don't have that yet. But I think if you can combine this, if you can create a real human experience, so to speak, but not being the same room, um, but being somewhere else and having a similar learning experience about what these other people do, right? I think that's there's something to it. But but I think it leads me to why do we actually travel? So what from a from a human experience, I think it's this we want to explore. We we have curiosity, right? Which is they have this in cats they do these experiments with cats and they take part of their brain out and then they only explore they don't learn anything they just go to the same places all the time and so we have this memory that we build up we make decisions but i think there's more to, to this idea of traveling especially extreme traveling i don't know what you probably met a lot of other extreme travelers what do you feel is what they were really after uh i well, I think this depends by this is different for each, each well not each, but there, there's probably different groups of, of 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 travelers, right? So so some people yeah. might be just there to to yeah to, just to tick off a list. Like I want to see uh, the Colosseum in Rome, and I want to see the Alpha Tower, and I want to see blah blah blah. But there's a more abstract reason behind it, right? Even if that's the concrete behavior but, that differs uh, a lot, what's the more abstract reasoning? 
well, for me, it's ab it's absolutely curiosity, and it's it's um, um, and, well, and not just explored, and you could have explored, say, a mine, or like like underground, right? Or you could have explored. You could have been curious about, I don't know, taking apart laptops. Like curiosity is a big word, right? But it doesn't have to be travel and people and other places and other food. It's it's it, there's a limit to this. Or there's this, there's this, It's it's more specific than that. Um, well, you mean there's different kinds of curiosity and, and, and right. travel is one, of, it, it and travel is one of them, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, um, I, yeah, so I think travel, what travel, well, talking about myself, what travel brings me is, sure. is, is, um, is a connection to, um, to people and places that I, that are, um, uh, strange to me or that are uh, unknown to me. And then, um, yeah, just to find out how how people how people think. Like like the example I gave before, the guy in Carabas who 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 didn't know that there's that that Europe is not an island. It's, it's all all these countries. Well, most of these countries are connected by land. Um, I found this highly interesting. I mean, it gave me a really a new a new. Um, a new view on on for something that for me is so i mean i i never even i mean ever as a european ever since you're a child you know europe is a is a continent and most countries are connected by land it's not nothing you ever think about and then suddenly this guy comes up and he asks this question and you're like wait a minute what why <laughs> where does that come from uh same thing i i when i traveled in colombia in 2009 i um uh, I, I met a girl and I invited her to, um, uh, so she, she's from a poor family. She has always lived in the highlands in Colombia. Uh, and then one day I found out that she had never uh, seen uh, the ocean. So I took her to the north of Colombia. And because I just couldn't imagine that someone, she was 29 years old. I couldn't imagine that someone 29 years old doesn't know what, what the sea looks like. So, so I took her to the north of Colombia, and and I will never forget her face when when we walked uh, on the beach, and sh she was looking like her eyes just couldn't believe what she was seeing. And for me, the sea. I mean, obviously, I was born like five kilometers from the sea. So I, I, I mean, most people in at least in Europe, in 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 the states, and in, in many places, most people know what the sea looks like. Like you see a horizon, and it's all water. Uh, but but for her, like she was looking like she she couldn't believe her eyes, like uh, uh, this is all water. And I said, well, you start swimming this direction, you end up in Spain. <laughs> you will not see. You probably see an island on the way, but it's all water between here and Spain. And she just she it was it, it was a crazy thing for her. And then um, which then for me was. Uh, was an interesting thought because I, I there's so many things you take for granted and then and then suddenly you realize that um, not everything is so uh, is is uh, is common knowledge for everyone. I mean it's it's you're, you're probably privileged if you you have seen this or if you've seen, if you've done that, but it doesn't mean that every everyone has done or seen the same thing. Uh, it is. If you know what I mean. No, I, I absolutely. I think this is this is a great way to put it. It's this this I call it mental models. I call this this how we map out the world, right? So we go we go out and and map our world, and then we eventually became become confident in it, and we we try to maybe change it a little bit. But it's that model that we feel is correct, and then from time to time, someone ch challenges us with a completely new model, and. Um, that's kind of my my big inspiration for travel too is seeing well maybe someone else has a better model what if someone's model is actually much more applicable than mine because mine is kind of crap and i don't even know where i have it from it's maybe from from elementary school or maybe it's from twitter i i i think it's really difficult for people to understand <coughs> where these models come from they don't come with the source attached to it and i think this is for 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 a lot of the political discussion especially we have these days you never know where this belief that usually it, 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 there's an overlay with um, political party or a certain left-right idea. 
you don't really know where these come from. And we don't know how these people made up these positions. And there's often like left, right positions in the US, at least they switch every six months. And you're like, whoops, well, we just thought that's the other side. That's the bad thing. And then we realize, no, it's, that's the good thing now. And uh, when, if people would know where these models come from that they use every day, these decision models, um, I think they would be better off. We don't have a capacity to memorize this. Maybe there's a reason to this, but that's something that I feel it could be better. And you, if you encounter a different model, and if you're intellectually and, and personally curious and honest enough, that excludes a lot of people, unfortunately, because they, 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 they're driven by fear and they're driven by, by negativity. But if you have enough positivity and you encounter another model, you will evaluate it and you will eventually, if it's good, you will adopt it. Probably you will forget where it came from. But you will continuously, and I think this is, this is my hope for people when they travel, they encounter a different situation and travel unless it kills you from diseases, from danger, but I feel that's relatively rare. It makes you a better person because invariably you're being exposed to things that challenge you to the core. Um, it's a lot of people who went to a very religious upbringing or religious school. They, they think their religion is the only one that exists and the other should just die out, right? That, that's ridiculous, but that's kind of what they learned from school. Maybe it wasn't told that way, but maybe implicit it was, was given that message. And then they go somewhere where there's another religion and they realize, hmm, that religion must work to some extent as well because, you know, people live somehow and the religion is a part of that. And there's all these, these, these models that we stack on top, there's more, there's more values that we, stop on, that we stack on religion. And once you go out there and, and evaluate all this and are curious and not just in your, in your, in your little um, small-minded view of the tourism ghetto, I think this is, this is beautiful. It brings out people's personality and they get more things to decide about. They don't have to be left or right or I'm in with this party. No, they can just choose from any number of things that fit their personal mental model and makes them a better person. Yeah, yeah, I, I very much agree. But the, the only thing um, um, which is very, which is crucial that you would need for that is, is to have an open mind. And I sure. think that's that. Uh, yeah, and I think that's where most people um, uh, might have a problem. I think but it's to like a certain wine. degree. I think it's like that. It's like well, wine. I when think you start drinking wine, you hate it. But then you you drink it for a while. You're like you can distinguish bad and good, and eventually you become really interested in expensive wines that used to be terrible in taste to you 12 months ago. That's a that's a very interesting analogy, but. <laughs> Well, yeah, you, I mean, we, we grew but, up with a closed mind. I mean, it's certainly genetic to an extent, but it gets exactly, better as we get older, no? Well, um, potentially, you would hope. You would hope so. Yeah, you would hope so. But I, I think we, as you say, I think we are. We all have, to a certain degree, we all have a closed mind. Uh, so, so, so the question probably at hand would be, what does it take to for for your mind to open up? Um, yeah. Uh, because, because honestly, I know I know travelers who have been to uh, probably to all countries, and they are very narrow-minded. Yeah. Uh, and you would, and you, <laughs> and you would, and you would That's say, true. well, one of the best ways to open up your mind is to travel. But if 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 you're not into opening your mind, then then you you can perfectly travel your whole life, and you you. You would not become an opener person. You probably would not become a wiser person. I think it really depends on yourself. On the other, yeah. on the other, like in Madagascar, talking about Madagascar, I remember uh, when we were kayaking down the river, we we stopped at a very small. It wasn't even a village. It was like a settlement, a few huts, and we, um, uh, with, with the guide, we we went into this uh, settlement and we talked to this really old. She didn't know her age, but she she assumed it was nine either 92 or 93 years old. Uh, and then we, we talked to this lady and she was a very wise woman. And we found out that she had never left her settlement. So, so then I realized, like I'm talking to someone in, in 2017 who has never seen a, a car, who has never been to her own capital city. She has never seen traffic. She's never been on a bus or a plane or, or she has never seen the sea she, she like the only thing she knows is is this like like her view she had a really nice view on the river and a few mountains and that's it 
and she every few days maybe there's a small boat passing by and that's that's her only contact with the outside world and then and then this woman has a very very wise thoughts and uh view on life um and i'm like okay she has never <laughs> And and my uh, remember this is the second last country I was about to visit. So she was my complete opposite, in, in a way, in let's say, in a way of traveling. Um, and I felt really humble. I was like, this woman is very open-minded. She can talk about anything I want uh, w w within a certain uh, frame, of course. But um, uh, and and she didn't have to travel f for any of that knowledge. She she just. She, she and she met very few people in her life. It's probably all mostly her family and maybe some neighbors, but uh, which were already far away because there was no no other house in sight. So the settlement was her family basically. And yeah. um, and I, I was completely I, I was really I, I still remember this lady because I was so uh, impressed. Like wow, <laughs> the, the, so so to, to go back to your question, you yeah, you, sure. And, uh, we, we can develop, we can we can grow, and hopefully when you're older, you're wiser. But um, do we need to travel? Well, not necessarily. Yeah, <clears throat> you're, you're disproving our point, our message. <laughs> but <laughs> I'm I sorry. It's, it's the no, <laughs> you, you, that's good. It's it's the in my mind, it's the exception to the rule. But it it doesn't mean I haven't really figured out how this how people go from from developing wisdom right so you you need to have the motivation that you think it's important you need to be interested in it you need to have the abstraction layers so you need to figure out what is a good solution right for these kinds of problems and i think we all intrinsically do this but some people immediately like you said they, they strike us as wise in old age and some people don't even if they're i don't know they're phds they're professors but they don't strike us as wise they're clearly knowledgeable about a couple of subjects, but yeah. maybe many subjects, but typically it's 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 focused on a certain on a certain topic. That's at least my observation. And the, the wisdom is when you abstract it out into further topics. So you you're more generalist. Again, that's maybe not necessarily true. And the way you get there, I mean, I honestly don't know what what is that that motivation. But but wisdom. I mean, there's a big five. Oh, the the, the big five. Uh, the op there's an openness indicator and the big five in the psychological analysis. There is an indicator for wisdom or for motivation to be wise at an, at an older age to get there. A lot of people are not interested in this. It's a good question. I feel there is a path out there, and there's there's multiple ways to to travel on this path, and it depends on your motivation, depends on your genetics, depends on what's common in your culture. Or, you know, what's easy for you to travel, not travel mentally, not necessarily in, in as a person. Um, I still feel if you take a lot of people, if you take a hundred people and you take them to a hundred different countries, I always say this when people go crazy on, on Twitter uh, in, in San Francisco, I say, why don't you just move to Ethiopia, give up everything, you can't take anything, not even your phone, just live there for two years and tell me two years if you have the same opinions. And I almost guarantee them they won't, right? Maybe some will because they hated everything and they shut down, but 99% will change. So I feel like there is there's certain experiences, kind of like school, you can, you can, they have an impact on people, not on everyone the same way, but you, you usually after 12 years of schooling, you know how to write. Some people don't, and they, they will be geniuses. Um, you know, they're like Richard Branson. But, but writing wasn't their thing. Maybe that's, that's why we said the wrong skills. But I think if you take a certain number of people on the same level of experiences, and I think travel is a wonderful tool, definitely not the only one, 99% or 95, whatever the number is, will create this understanding of other people, but in a, in a good sense, right? In a, not in a just virtual signaling way, but in a way that they truly try to understand other people because it's in their own good. That's what I'm, what, where I'm coming from. Uh, this is an it's a tricky topic, discussion. you know. I didn't know no, no, we were well, going to arrive at how do it, it, how do we it, it, how do we become wise? That's no, no, a, this is this is. Uh, I don't I don't think this is tricky. I think it's very it, it's really super interesting. Yeah. Um, 
but uh, yeah, well, we can talk all night about this. But <laughs> I want to um, let you go because uh... no, 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 no. But but I have not, no, no. I'm I'm not I'm not in a hurry at, at all. So I, I don't care. But um, uh, I'm I, I did it. What... So we, we, we don't <laughs> oh, okay. have much time left. Okay. <laughs> well, I I didn't expect us to end up uh, in this discussion. <laughs> Before, well, before same here, same here. But here's the good news: we can pick it up next time. Maybe we can actually prepare, um, read some research, um, educate ourselves, get a little bit more wise, and then, uh, you know, map out the chart how travel makes you wise, or maybe it doesn't. Maybe we're just assuming. Oh, well, uh, I, I believe it does. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, I think it's going to be I, very good, very good topic for the next episode. As 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 I said before, it it does if you. Um, if you allow it to. Yeah, there's more to it for sure. And I, and I, I totally agree with what you said before. You, you send 100 people to uh, whatever country and uh, for a year or two years or whatever, and they, they will come back uh, a, a broader-minded person. A better person. Most, mo right. most of them, most of them. Yeah. Actually, the, the thing I want to... Can I still say something? Or, or yeah, 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 <laughs> of course. Well, the thing, uh, because it's a little bit in this line. When when I was uh, when I was younger, I I, I half jokingly said that uh, because I was when I was at high school, I was the only one not to go to university because I thought I've been in school now for fifteen years. I need to first see the world and travel, whatever, and then then I will decide what I want to do in life and study, whatever. Um, and they thought uh, back then that that was really weird. I mean, you were supposed to go to university uh, after high school, full stop. Uh, so I told, I jokingly said, if 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 one day I become a minister of uh, education in my country, uh, I will make it compulsory for uh, for people who graduate high school to, I will prevent them from going to university. I will I will force them to <laughs> to first do, you know, work or travel or do something completely different, and then decide what they want to do in their lives, and then they can pick up. Uh, you know, uh, studies, or they can they can continue working or traveling, or you know, because I was convinced that that this will this will have a much bigger impact than 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 going to university straight away, because you're you're in a protected environment in school, right? You're you're, you're half yeah. detached from the real from the reality, the real world, um, and and I'm really happy that I see like younger people I see now, they often take like a gap, the name is now a gap year, they often take a gap year to, to do exactly that, to, to, to do something else after high school and then, uh, you know, evaluate and decide what they want to do in their lives. And I think this is a really yeah. good development. Yeah, I think we, there is, there's a lot of potential that we based a lot of human potential out there because we sent them through this idea of a hundred years ago when we invented schools and colleges that we, we, we streamlined them to become industrial workers. Now they are intellectually or like you, you work with your mind industrial workers, but you still have this, this time um, allotted to it and it gets longer and longer and some of the people are still not ready, it seems. So they need to be 40 now to get any decent job and soon it's going to be 50. So, I mean, at one point they're going to be 80 before they have a decent job that has any demand to it, right? Or isn't just a simple job. So the, there is a, there's a big thesis out there, and Peter Thiel has obviously popularized it here in the U.S. to to get people actively out of the university and get them into like a startup, just like a one or two year accelerator program. Things where they actually can do something before they engage in what I what I want to do for the rest of my life. Through I think because we have pushed people into this mindset, now it's over. People are like, there is nothing that I want to do for the rest of my life. I do things for two or three years and I go to the next state, which is easy in America, but it's troublesome in Europe. I think people haven't fully grasped how the economy in the world has changed because in Europe, you are supposed to have that mindset in Japan and you know China, they, they still kind of live in that world. So it's going to be interesting how they react. Yep. Any, anyways, Boris, that was fantastic. Yeah, we yeah, covered yeah. so much stuff. I could, could really see your, your, your personality shine through. Uh, thanks for doing this. Thanks for taking the time. And uh, um, I'm, I'm really excited to maybe hear more stories from you next time. I learned a lot. Uh, just drop me a line. You, you know how to find me and, and, and uh, feel free to, um, to, to invite me over. It would be my pleasure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Looking forward to it. Me too. Boris, talk soon.